and you must sign up sign up the evaluation or attendance form that are posted in zoom in our facebook page and in our youtube channel the certificate of participation will be sent to your respective email right after the webinar take note only paid participants will receive the certificate however if you are around and want to receive a certificate kindly fill up the evaluation or attendance form and send an email to PIES 21. Paid participants who didn't receive their certificate of participation within a day, please email to centuryeducators1920 or 1920 at gmail.com or centuryeducator21gmail.com. Again, we are presently viewed on different social media platforms. You can see us live in the official Facebook page of Pies I Twenty One. And we have delayed telecast in YouTube at the POMI channel. And we are also live in Zoom video conferencing. While waiting for the presentation to appear, I would like also to greet our participants who came all the way from Binangon and Rizal. We also have participants who came all the way from Roja City, Capiz. And we also have participants who came from Argao in Cebu. Again, we are viewed in different parts of the Philippines. We have from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And we have thousands of participants from different parts of the country and also abroad. We have those who are messaging, especially about their connection. Again, I would like you to, uh, uh, to take a look at your own internet connection, especially those who are struggling with the audio or internet connectivity. And again, we have our speaker for this afternoon. She's a faculty of Iloilo Science and Technology University, and once a former dean of the College of Arts and Sciences of St. Paul University, Iloilo. She has been in, uh, in teaching for more than two decades already. And currently she's also teaching in the College of Education graduate education program and the coordinator of the national and international affairs for marketing and communications. I would like also to greet our participants who came all the way from Sibulao Elementary School in Zamboanga City. We have those who are asking questions, especially about the certificates. We will be providing you updates later on. And again, I was, I was able to inform you already, especially about the process of getting the certificate. Thank you so much. Professor Casella for the introduction. Um, we would like to apologize for the delay to all of those who are watching in Cebu, in Binangon and Rizal, in Capiz, and in Western Visayas, even um, from Bangkok, Thailand. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for being with us here today. At the onset, I would like to thank the Philippine Institute of 21st Century Educators Incorporated to their talented, smart, and energetic national president, Professor Emijan Indunila Palmani, to Dr. Raymond B. Moreno, the national president of FOREP, to Dr. Gina Haresco, the national president of CESREP, and to Professor Ricky Kibinko for the invitation to speak on learning to teach online. Um, I would like to share already my screen so that you will see my slide. Okay. I hope everyone can see my PowerPoint right now. Okay. 
So ladies and gentlemen, in this unprecedented time of the COVID-19 pandemic, academic communities all over the world have been challenged on how to guarantee the continuation of teaching and learning without compromising the security and the safety and the health of their faculty members and teachers, faculty members and students alike. And in one united voice, the academic community claim that they will be using flexible learning and strict health protocols as part of the answer flexible learning as the platform, the official platform that they will use for academic year 2020-2021. The Commission on Higher Education and the Department of Education here in the Philippines are also using flexible learning modalities. And basically this becomes the reason for the many webinars that we are all seeing all over the internet. There have been so many webinars about flexible learning, about blended learning, and most of them are repetitions of each other. And at the same time, some of them are already confusing others. So the very goal of our webinar this afternoon is to basically clean up our minds. Let's somehow forget everything first as of the moment, and let's start clean so that we avoid the confusions from the rest of the webinars that we have attended. I'm not saying you totally forget about it, okay? Let's just say that at this point in time, from for two hours at least, let's just forget about the rest and focus on what we're going to share this afternoon. Also note that the sharing this afternoon is based on the mantra, love to learn. We have to remember that our foremost responsibility as teachers is to make our students fall in love with learning. But as I was you know, thinking about the webinar this afternoon, I was thinking, how will some of the teachers make students fall in love with learning when they themselves are having a hard time thinking of how to teach online, taking into consideration that the Department of Education have stated that there's no face-to-face -face meeting, no, no residential meetings, no face-to-face -face meetings. And I believe the Commission on Higher Education is following suit because of the rising um, cases of COVID-19 infections in the Philippines. So today is our chance to Stop worrying, stop thinking of what problems may actually arise, but plan together a proper way, a foolproof way on how to transmit knowledge to our students, but not forgetting to make them fall in love just the same with how we're teaching just as we did when we were all inside the classroom. So today, that's what we are going to do. We are going to plan together on what to do on August when classes start. But let me just give you some reminders though. Let's start slow and let's start, because when you start slow, it becomes really sure and really clear. You have to take into consideration that information overload spoils motivation. So I am not going to bombard you this afternoon with a lot of highfalutin words and buzzwords that um, we have been hearing in a lot of webinars. This afternoon, the goal is to simplify. We will simplify online learning. I know that there are a lot of, of teachers who are intimidated on how they're going to go about online learning come August 2020. But don't worry. This afternoon, we will help each other. We will simplify everything. And after the two-hour webinar, you'll think, yes, I can do it. This is it. We have to learn the essentials only. You don't necessarily have to know everything there is to know about the internet. You don't need to know all the hundreds and hundreds of 
online applications. If you know five and they are effective and they are okay with the signal of your students and yours as well, you're good to go. You can teach online. Simplify. Retain the essential. That's the point of everything. Be patient with yourself. Learning how to teach online is never easy, but it can be done if and only if you are patient with yourself because some of the applications become a little bit complicated. The interface is not friendly. So, you know, somehow you have to learn how to take it slow and sure and be patient with yourself so that at the end of the day, you have how many weeks until the opening of classes. By the time you meet your students on the first day of class, online synchronously, you are confident. So that's our goal for today, okay? So how do we really teach online? First tip is learn by attending trainings like this. However, I said a while ago that you don't need to really attend every single seminar or webinar that you see online. Choose the ones that will simplify ideas for you. We have to remember that as teachers, we also need to simplify content and ideas to our students. We are not here to burden them. We are not here to make their lives complicated. In this unprecedented time of the COVID-19 pandemic, when everybody is having a hard time with their connection, with their connectivity, with their gadget, gadgets, etc., we have to be compassionate. So let's start with ourselves. Let us not bombard ourselves with information and then at the end of the day, we give up because we're so confused already. So when you attend seminars, there are a lot of buzzwords, but there are these eight buzzwords that you're not supposed to forget, at least in the first semester or in the academic year 2020-2021. And that would be flexible learning modality, blended learning, asynchronous communication, synchronous communication, open educational resources, massive open online courses, learning management systems, and residential learning. And because our goal this afternoon is to simplify things, then let us clarify in the most simple way each of these passwords that I have just mentioned. First is residential learning. As you can see, there aren't a lot of text on my screen. I, I don't want to put a lot of definitions there. You know why? The tendency for webinar participants is to get a screenshot of your slide and then after that, do something else because, and not listen to your explanation because they know that after the webinar, they can go back to the definition and then read it and understand it by themselves. Yeah, because I'm also like that. That's why I'm not doing it right now. So. What you see on this slide right now is just a picture and the title, Residential Learning. What do we mean by residential learning? Residential learning does not refer to your home, does not refer to your house, does not refer to your residence. It refers to the school. Residential learning is basically face-to-face -face learning. You, the teacher, and the students go to school together inside the classroom to have uh, instructional delivery. That's what we mean by residential learning. Next is synchronous learning. What do we mean by that? It just simply means that you, the teacher, and the students together are online at the same time, on the same application, doing the same thing. Asynchronous learning means a teacher may upload the module or an activity or a quiz or a reading material or a YouTube link for the student to watch maybe a day after, two days after, with a deadline of maybe after five days, which means that they are not really together online. Okay, simple as that. Next is flexible learning. This is the most popular word in the academe for 2020, bar none. We do not need 
statistical analysis or statistical data for that. It's just all over every webinar that you attend. Flexible learning. But what is flexible learning really? Because others get confused about flexible learning. They think flexible learning is online learning only, which is not really the case. This definition that I have right now is from Dr. Ed Fermin. He is the Vice President of Academic Affairs of Nat National Teachers College. I was one of the 100 faculty members sent by Iloilo Science and Technology University to attend the online certificate training on flexible learning modalities. And this is the definition that he gave us, which made so much sense to me, at least, because I can only speak for myself. It says here, flexible learning is the design and delivery of programs, courses, and interventions that address, let me minimize my screen and the uh, interventions that address the learner's unique needs in terms of pace, place, process, and product. Take note that I have highlighted four keywords there, pace, place, process, and product. All four keywords that are highlighted there will basically tell you what flexible learning is. And Dr. Ed Fermin, also has this model of the flexible learning modality. But, well, I wasn't able to ask permission to use it in the webinar right now. So I created a representation of the model for your consumption, okay? So you have pace, place, process, and product, the four keywords. What do we mean by pace here? It basically refers to the experience, going through the experience. Will a student go through the experience of learning with you? Will it be led by the teacher? Or will the student go through the learning experience all by himself? That's faith. Play. Where will the student experience learning? Will it be residential? Remember, we defined it earlier. Residential, will it be in school? Will it be in any place inside the school? Will it be in, in a specific location like the library? Will it be in, um, under the tree? Residential, as long as it is in the school, that is considered residential because you have to face each other. It's face-to-face -face learning. Or will it be distance or remote? It means that you study, you experience learning at home or wherever you are located um, as of the moment. Process, how one experiences learning. How will you experience learning? Will you be able to read modules? Will it be modular? Will you be able to turn pages and smell the paper? Or will it be simulated? meaning you have to use an internet signal. Product. Product will be the evidence of learning. What evidence will your students give you at the end of the term or at the end of the learning outcome or at the end of a three-hour class or at the end of one week? Will it be the traditional way? What's the traditional way? of evidence learning, of submitting something. Basically, it's on paper, right? Printed paper, anything that you've written on, or non-traditional, which basically refers to anything online. So let us explain further teacher-led pace, teacher-led pacing. Teacher-led pacing could either be synchronous or asynchronous. Self-paced could be independent or guided, meaning you could just give your student a module at the beginning of the class, and then you see each other at the end of the semester, and he or she returns the module to you. Guided, meaning there are certain instructions there 
on what he's supposed to do on what particular day and what particular time, etc. Residential could be classroom or site specific. As I mentioned a while ago, it could be in the library, it could be in a laboratory, especially for those who are teaching um, electricity, drafting, T, uh, HE, TLE, etc. Distance or remote, it could be wired on or non wired. A lot of people think that distance learning is just online. But during this pandemic, there are some students who live in a place where the internet has not even arrived yet. And that is not their fault. So what do you do? You give them non-wired education by sending them modules through a courier, non-wired. Modules. Modules could be printed or non-printed. You could send them through email. You could upload it in a Google Drive or you can upload it in the Google Classroom or Edmodo or Facebook groups, whatever um, LMS you would, you would choose for yourself or the institution has chosen for the rest of their faculty members. And stimulation could be remote at home or in, um, when you say job-based, let's say for example, a student is working, is a working student, but not in school. And whatever he is doing in, in that particular job is related to the lesson that you have. That could be documented and that could also be submitted to you in your class. Traditional, manual or automated. Will you ask your students to write manually on a one whole sheet of bad paper, their reflection about um, a certain literary piece or will he or she submit to you through email, Edmodo, or any application for that matter which is automated. Non-traditional could be an actual performance or recorded performance. Can somebody, can a student do actual performance, performance online? Yes, using Facebook Live. Facebook Live does not lie. When you are on Facebook Live, it will tell you exactly what time it started. The teacher will know what time it started and what time it has ended. And the teacher will see exactly what you're doing right now because it's on real time. Recorded performance, uh, a student could record himself baking, doing a certain, doing the procedure for creating a dish for that matter, upload it on YouTube and send the link to the teacher. That is an example of a product, but recorded performance. So that's flexible learning. There are so many things that you can do in flexible learning modality. It does not just simply mean online only. No, it does not. How about blended learning? Let's simplify it. Face-to-face -face learning, you see each other. Online learning, you just basically are asynchronous or synchronous online. You mix it up, you get blended learning. So for example, um, I'm teaching technology TTL1. So let's say, for example, I plan to meet my students on the first day of class. And then I give them a module. And in that module, they will know what particular date will they go online, what website will they go, what application will they open, what will they do there, etc. And then we will meet face to face for their exam in the midterm. And then for the finals, they will have activities online. And then we will meet each other for their final exam. So which means that in the entire semester, we have three face-to-face -face schedules and the rest is online. Will we consider that blended learning? Definitely. Yes. Yes, we can. But what if from the beginning of the class until the end, from the beginning of the school year, first semester, for example, from the beginning of the first semester until the end of the first semester, 
you just meet online. Will that be considered blended learning? No, it's online learning, distance online learning. So what are the benefits of blended learning? Blended learning allows you to plan, to strategize on what you're supposed to give your students in terms of content. Content, what pedagogy are you going to use for the content? And at the same time, what technology are you going to mix with the content and the pedagogy? So it will allow you to strategize for that. It enables the teacher to personalize the instruction. What do we mean when we personalize instruction? Definitely you have to take into consideration the connectivity of your students. If your students do not have very good connectivity, you cannot use certain applications which ask for too much bandwidth. So that's one factor of personalizing instruction, okay? Multiple communication platform. We have to admit that there are some students that never speak when coerced or when asked in a face-to-face -face class. But whenever they are in an online class, they are vocal. Why? Because, well, some of them are introverted, some of them are shy until after you are online and you don't really have, and they don't really have to show their face to you. So um, you are giving them an avenue also to express themselves. It's collaborative. Blended learning is collaborative. Collaborative, not just for students, but for teachers at the same time. And we have to admit that learning becomes more interesting when you're doing it online because of the various applications that you will be using. We know and we have heard so many times that the teacher is the best visual aid ever. But however, at this point in time, we have to know that we have a competition because online there are just so many things that you can do and your face isn't even there. And most of the time you are not even there talking to them, but it's okay because everything becomes interesting and we don't get to bore our students. So these are some sample online collaboration tools and online activities. I am only giving you the ones that are, well, some are common, some, some think, some have been using this already, but if you have not, note that these are the easier applications that you can use that even your students can use if especially if their signal is uh, mediocre or poor so you have google keep it helps save notes photos isn't it that our students would usually um write down notes and then photocopy their notebooks because the exams are coming well since we cannot be we cannot go to school face to face, yet they can still do that online using Google Keep. They can share their notes on Google Keep, photos, voice memos, and checklists. They can share it with their group. Google Drive, we all know it's a file sharing application. You can upload your PowerPoints there, documents, modules, photos, and other digital files. And the good thing is that there's 15 gigabytes for free for everyone. Believe it or not, my PowerPoint since 2005 is still in my Google Drive. And basically I can share it at a whim to anybody who is asking for it because I don't need to look for it, you know, in, in, a, in a computer, in a desktop, a laptop, or a flash drive, etc. It's just there. And you can access it anytime, even if you're mobile. Google Docs, it helps create document spreadsheets or presentation and share it with the teacher or students or even co-workers. Multiple people can edit at the same time and that is what's best about Google Docs. So if you are teaching English for that matter, let's say for example, you would like your students to make a literary criticism of a particular novel and you group them into five. 
and you want to do that synchronously, can you do that using Google Docs? Yes. Because multiple people can edit at the same time. And that's beautiful. Why? It's free. You don't have to pay for it. OneDrive by Microsoft allows you to collaborate. Uh, if you are teaching, let's say, for example, you're teaching mathematics, Math 101. Three of us are teaching Math 101. I wish I'm teaching Math 101. <laughs> it's a dream come true, if that's the case. So if three of us are teaching Math 101, and the three of us are sharing the same syllabus, the sh sharing the same course outline, the same topic for the week, et cetera, and we would like to create a PowerPoint for that. Can we collaborate on how to create that PowerPoint without meeting each other? Yes, we can, with the help of OneDrive. So you can collaborate on creating a PowerPoint, Word, Excel, and OneNote. And of course, there are other things that you can do collaboratively online. You can look for interactive displays for your students. Uh, you can do video conferencing using Google Meet, Zoom, Facebook Rooms, Microsoft Teams, WebEx. We, I will discuss that further later. You can look for design tools for students taking up architecture, engineering, um, drafting. And of course, this particular application for which we have been using without realizing it we have never realized that we have collaborated with so many students and people using facebook messenger because we thought that well anyway that's what you use every day to communicate with something else especially if you need something or especially if you have a meeting so they remind you through that but actually that is already a form of collaboration i know if that if you are a teacher and if you have been teaching for quite some time, I'm sure that you have a Facebook group chat with your students for a specific subject. And you use it to remind each other about uh, your, their project, your activity for your class, et cetera. And that is already an example of collaboration. And most of us have not realized it until now. So these are, some of the examples, some, which means there are still many that you can look for in the internet. All you have to do is search for them. Next is OER. OERs, what are OERs? They are open educational resources. So um, when you're teaching, you can use courses, modules, learning objects, textbooks, videos, test banks, images, that are okay to pass around or to share. If you are a teacher, you are aware that you cannot photocopy a book, an entire book. You cannot do that without asking permission from the author. But OERs are okay to share. And what's good about it is it's online. Note that the Commission on Higher Education has launched in June 2020, Phil Ched Connect. These are in, this is in partnership with Fulbright Philippines, British Council, and Cambridge University Press, Australian National University Press, Oxford University Press, Springer Publishing, and you can access all those books. You can share them with your students without asking permission. You are free to share them. That is the beauty of open education resources. So, and not just the Commission on Higher Education has this, DepEd also has DepEd Commons. And what is good about DepEd Commons is that if you are a Globe and Smart subscriber and you are in the Philippines, you can access it for free. So, thank you so much, DepEd, for that. One, another thing is massive open online courses. During the course of the summer, um, I noticed a lot of my colleagues on Facebook have been sharing the certificates that they've earned from massive open online courses. And I was so jealous that they were able to finish multiple classes. Like, I wish I could have done that. 
However, some of us are having a hard time to look for massive open online courses. Now, here's the tip. All you have to do is to download the application EDX. And that is, that is the icon of EDX, this one, this colorful three letter, okay? EDX is your window to global higher education. It becomes easier to look for certificate free, hashtag free, certificate online courses from very good universities all over the world. You have Harvard there, you have MIT, Boston University, you have Seoul National University, you have um, University of Toronto, and actually, in I think around the last week of June, I was able to enroll on the course Instructional Design, Digital Media, New Tools and Technology with the University of Queensland, Australia. And I'm supposed to finish it by August 21. And so far, I'm done with the two weeks worth of uh, classes but I don't know if I can finish the entire thing. It's so good, actually. So please do try EDX because it will really help you, you know, uh, gain more knowledge specifically on your field of experience. Next is LMS, Learning Management System. So let me define that a little bit uh, because this is not so common for everyone. A learning management system is a software-based platform that facilitates the management, delivery of, and assessment in the teaching learning process. It is used to deploy a variety of learning strategies across different formats, including formal, experiential, and social learning to manage instructional delivery. What are the advantages of LMS? Flexibility to learners. That's why we're using it for flexible learning. Blended learning. Extended learning. Increased social learning, improved engagement, because everybody is on social media. Why, I'm, why am I emphasizing social media? You will know in a while why. And it's geographically independent. It doesn't matter where you are in this beautiful archipelagic Philippines. As long as you have an internet connection, you can learn. You can um, check in your LMS and do whatever assignments, readings, or video clip viewings that your teacher has assigned to you. And technical support. You don't have to pay for it. All you have to do is to report an anomaly in the application to their technical support, and hopefully they will fix it for you. Okay. Now, the free learning management systems that are easier to use. Remember, we are simplifying things. I'm not going to mention everything to all of you this afternoon. I'm going to choose what's easier to use, especially with the kind of internet connectivity that we have here in the Philippines. So Facebook groups is one. Edmodo is another. Google Classroom is another. You can go check out Moodle if you like and Schoology also. But the, the downside for Moodle and Schoology is it really asks for the official um, email of your school. So basically, if your school doesn't want to use Moodle, then you just have to look for something else. That's why... I have, I'm, I'm highly recommending Facebook groups, Edmodo, and Google Classroom. Now, why is Facebook groups number one in the recommended free learning management system there? Because number one, everybody has a Facebook account. Number two, you can access Facebook even if your internet connectivity is poor. Why? because they have Facebook Lite. If you are located in the Philippines where signal is poor and intermittent, download Facebook Lite. 
so that it's easier for you to access to access it. Edmodo, I had been using, I have been using Edmodo since 2012. Until now. You can ask my students, I'm using this. Why? Because Edmodo, let's just say that Edmodo is so easy to use. And there are so many advantages, which I will discuss to you in depth later. And last, uh, and you might ask why, but, but if you have been using Edmodo for, since 2012, that would be seven years. I don't know, you do the math. If I have been using Edmodo for that amount of time, why is, is it only second to my recommendation? Because Edmodo takes so much bandwidth. My students would always tell me, ma'am, I could not get in Edmodo because my signal is bad. So it becomes a problem. And as teachers, remember our goal for today, simplify. Do not make life complicated to your students. It means that we have to look for ways so that we can guarantee the continuity of learning of our students. So if they cannot access Edmodo, why use Edmodo? That's why Facebook groups is number one in my recommendation because it's easier for everyone to use, especially to those with intermittent signal. And my last recommendation is Google Classroom. It's good even if you have intermittent signal. The problem with Google Classroom is it becomes a little bit more complicated because of its interface. And if you would like to give quizzes, formative quizzes for that matter, you have to use Google Form. So there are other applications which are Google-based that you have to know how to operate in order for you to complete the entire lesson plan. And for me, that's already complicated. I would like to recommend something, an LMS that does everything for a teacher all at once. And I will prove that later, that you can use Facebook in one lesson plan. Because I'm going to present to you an online lesson for uh, junior high school. Okay, so let's proceed. Here, the advantages of using Edmodo as an LMS. Number one, its interface is not complicated. It's so easy. Even if you're new with it, you're not going to have, uh, have a hard time using it. I swear, promise. You can create your own library of PowerPoints, online documents, and even online links. You, I swear my PowerPoint from 2012 are still there. And since uh, for so many years, I have been teaching grammar, technical writing, so basically grammar, uh, technical writing, punctuation marks, capitalization. When I taught grammar, uh, I have PowerPoints there for subject verb agreement, for tenses, etc. And it's still there. So you have your own library and it's safe and secure. You can create a test bank there. So if you're teaching English, like me, because I've been teaching English, your tests for your, yeah, your assessment for tenses, punctuation marks, and subject verb agreement, you can reuse it and reuse it and reuse it with other students in separate years, which is good, right? Quizzes are a little more, more secure because time can be set and it automatically locks down after which lessens the possibility of students cheating during a formative quiz. Because that is the worry of a lot of teachers. In the webinars that I have attended on assessment, that is the first thing that they would usually ask. How can we lessen cheating in online assessment? And um, resource speakers would always say, you can never, ever lessen you, because you're not there. And even inside the classroom, that you're there, that you're looking at the student, they're cheating. How much more if they're at home and taking the quiz and they're alone? So it's just impossible, right? 
But I swear that and Modo, because it's time, it will lessen cheating. So if you have 10 items for multiple choice, give them one minute. If it's one minute really long for one item, if you think it is, then give them 30 seconds. So 30 seconds per number. If, if your quiz is just about subject verb agreement, is our what, uh, is, is our has have, so you can give them 30 seconds per number. Or if you think that's too short, then give them one minute. So for 10 items, you have 10 minutes. And set, it for, set the quiz for 10 minutes and automatically, after 10 minutes, it will lock down, whether they're finished or not. So if I am a student and I understand that if I don't finish this quiz after 10 minutes, it's not gonna make me, it's not gonna allow me to answer anymore, I am not going to bother to look at my notebook for the answer, right? So that's why I'm highly recommending Edmodo. Multiple choice and true or false quizzes are automatically scored and recorded. Imagine the book of the task taken off your shoulder. You're not going to check them manually anymore because the application will check it for you and record it for you. Easy. It is easy to grade assignments and it has a class record. That is why I'm highly recommending Edmodo if and only if your internet signal is good. Number two, assess your student's internet connection as well as your own. Uh, there are three categories to assess the connectivity of your students. Category three is with connectivity, category two with limited connectivity, and category one uh, without connectivity. So our dream is this, that we will, our internet speed would reach 73 Mbps. That would be heaven for everyone teaching online. That would be really, really fast. But the reality is that we only have, that is actually, my internet speed at home, 880 kbps during bad times. And sometimes I even have 1.5 kbps. What can I do with 1.5 kbps? But that is the reality that we have in the Philippines. So how can you assess, how can you let your students assess their internet signal? Tell them to go to fast.com to check their internet speed. This is the first thing that you have to do on the first day of online class. You ask your student, what's your internet speed? Because the kind of online delivery and online applications that you will have and you will use should be based on their capability. And at this time, we are not even thinking about their mental capability, but their internet speed which is really very important. Um, in June 2020, Dr. Ramil Lumawag, who is the coordinator for instruction of ISAT Yumiagao, it's one of our external campuses, conducted a survey um, to ISAT U students regarding their connectivity. And I think this is just for the main campus in La Paz. And 59%, which is 3,937 of our student population has limited connectivity. Well, 59%, that, that's sad. Because what happens to the rest of half of the, the population if they have something else, right? So 27% claim that they do not have connectivity at all. That is still a big chunk of the population. And only 14%. 14 has stable connection. And I'm sure that this 14% live in the city and the rest are living outside of the city or in the neighbor, neighboring provinces. So this is the scenario that we have in our school, which is why the administration of ESATU decided for us to use Facebook as a social learning platform. That is the rationale why we're using Facebook. Because as I said a while ago, Facebook uses less bandwidth. 
Facebook. Everyone has Facebook. If you don't have Facebook, where have you been if you don't have Facebook? If you are not on Facebook at this, at this time in the century, in the 21st century, it's like as if you are not a real existing person. You are not a netizen. You don't have a double citizenship. I have double citizenship. I'm a Filipino and I'm a netizen. Oh, di ba? <laughs> it is easier to use. Facebook is easier to use. Facebook Live is created specifically for people who stay in locations with intermittent internet connection. So if your students are living outside the city, if they're living in the provinces with in intermittent internet signal, then recommend that they use Facebook Live. So um, if you would like to know more, on how to create a Facebook social learning group, do check out the channel of Dr. Ramil Lumawag. Um, he has a channel on, on Facebook and he has uploaded there uh, how to create a Facebook social learning group. This is exactly um, what the faculty members of Edila Science and Technology University have been trained last June because we will be using Facebook as an official LMS in the first semester of academic year 2020 2021. If you would like to further know about it, then check out his channel on YouTube. YouTube, yes. Okay, number three, check the device that your students will be using for their classes. Is it really necessary to have a high end device for online classes? The answer is a big no, capital N and O, no. So what if our, some of our students only have a smartphone with one gigabyte of RAM? Can they, can they still join our online classes? Yes, definitely. That is why it is your responsibility on the first day of class to assess what gadgets are they using, what, the, what is the capability of their gadget, and at the same time, their internet speed, because your online instructional delivery will be based on those capabilities, specifically on those capabilities. But you don't have to worry if in case most of your students would tell you online, mom, sir, I only have one gigabyte, a, a smartphone with one gigabyte of RAM. Don't worry about that because we have Android Go online applications. These applications will, were introduced in 2017, and the objectives of these applications, the objective of these applications is to work on devices with less than one gigabyte of RAM, and in areas of the world where internet connection is notoriously low quality. So the question is, are you really going to use all these Android Go online applications? Not necessarily, all you have to do is to download uh, this one, YouTube Go, and Gmail Go. Okay. Can you teach with only three or five applications? Can you teach online with just that? The answer is a big yes. Yes, yes, and yes. And you will know later why. Okay. So this is an example. This is a screen capture of YouTube Go. That's a logo. What is good about YouTube Go? It asks you before you play a video on what resolution would you like to watch the video with? Would you like to watch it using the data saver? This 15 minute and 24 seconds video um, can be watched using 14.1 MB only. But if you want to watch it with a standard resolution, then you will need 57.3 MB. And if you're going to watch it with high resolution, then you need 80.5 MB. So if I am a student and number one, I have poor connections and number two, I don't have the money for data, then definitely I'm going to use the data saver. And believe me, I tried it because I also live in a particular place where internet signal is intermittent, sometimes I want to die, it's very effective. 
and it doesn't even chop. It's not choppy. I swear, try it later after our webinar, of course. Not now, you listen first, okay? <laughs> Number four, design your lessons based on TPAC. If you have been teaching for quite some time, I know that you are familiar with TPAC, okay? TPAC is Mishra and Kohler's 2006 model. Now, if you are teaching online, you, you just don't basically go online and tell your students, okay, this is our lesson. Uh, watch it on YouTube. I'll see you on Monday next week. It's not like that. You have to make sure that the technology or the applications that you're using is bagay with the content that you have. And at the same time, with the strategies, with the methodologies, or in short, the pedagogy that you're going to have. All these three have to be a perfect mix or else you're going to have a problem in transmitting knowledge, in guaranteeing teaching and learning. So this is um, the matrix that I created for you. So if you are, this, these are examples, okay? This is not set in stone. This is just an example I'm giving you, but you could basically make your own after. So if your content is, if you're teaching literary criticism, essay, writing, technical writing, you can use content-focused methods or learner-centered methods. And the technology that you could use to, and you could partner with that would be Weebly, WordPress. I'm sure that you're familiar with WordPress, Facebook groups, Edmodo and Google Classroom. If you're teaching HE laboratory, science laboratory, electricity drafting, fashion and design, you could use the demonstration method and the technology to use or the applications to use are YouTube, Vimeo, TikTok, Facebook Live. Now, you might be asking me, why did I highlight in red, very red, TikTok there? Now, let me tell you a very brief story about that. Because before, I thought TikTok is just for people who would like to be popular. I thought TikTok um, is an application for people who know how to dance and who love dancing. That's it. You know, it's true what they say. If you don't try an application, if you don't try using an application, then you will really not know its benefit. So, well, in the Philippines, we had ECQ around April. You can't go out of the house. So we would just go out for groceries once a week. And one of us, you know, one of us can only go out of the house. So basically you're inside the house the whole time and you get so bored. I was so bored with my life. I downloaded TikTok. Yes, I have a TikTok account. Don't tell my students that. And you know what I discovered? There are scientific experiments on TikTok. There are procedures for cooking on TikTok. I have learned a lot of recipes on TikTok, believe it or not. And I try them at home and they're actually delicious. Um, there are, uh, like if you would like to sew a blouse or something without using the machine, whatever they call that, there's something like that on TikTok. So TikTok is not just about dancing. It's about a lot of things under the sun. One time I asked my TTL1 students, can you actually use TikTok um, as a technology inside the classroom? And they all said, yes. That time I did not have any idea about TikTok. So I got confused and I asked them, okay, can, can you please explain why your answer is yes? And they told me why, but I still did not totally understand their answer, answer until after I created my own TikTok account. But I did not dance on TikTok, okay? I, I just browsed, believe me. So let's proceed. Uh, if you're teaching religious education, values education, literature, you can use the bus group method. And then for that matter, you can use Facebook Messenger Rooms, Messenger video chat or group chat, Zoom, Google, Google Meet. Um, I just would like to go back though to Facebook Live here. Why can we use Facebook Live 
for HE Laboratory, Science Lab, Electricity Drafting, Fashion and Design. Because if you would like your student to demonstrate on real time, because you don't like them pre-recording their output, because when they pre-record their output, it becomes really perfect. And all your students will get perfect scores, right? So it would be better if you let them demonstrate on real time using Facebook Live so that you really see what happens there. You really see the mistakes. You really see if they're truly good in what they do, that they really have the skill. So that is so much more recommended than the rest. If you're teaching political science, governance, current events, you can use the interactive participative methods and use Twitter and Facebook Messenger. For media and information literacy, advertising, fashion and design, you can use project-based methods and the technology or application that would be best to what that would uh, be a partner to these two would be Instagram, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Pinterest. Okay. Now you might be asking, why are a lot of these social media applications? Am I a fan of social media applications? Let's say I am a fan of social learning. Now, we have to take consideration, we have to take into consideration that the school is an avenue for all of us to socialize and develop our psychosocial skills. We join clubs and this become our physical learning communities. We also develop our talents to these learning communities and these learning communities help us make sense of the world. And when we already are working or when we are out of the school, we use technology to further create learning groups online. And this facilitates our ability to create content and share content with everybody across the globe. So in that case, you create meaning globally. That is why I'm a fan of social learning and, high, and, and high, I highly believe in it. And that is also why I'm recommending that you visit again Dr. Ramilo Mawag's uh, YouTube channel because he was able to discuss the social learning concept there. So check it out if you would like to know more about it. So Ramil, if you're watching, hello. <laughs> Applications for synchronous classes. What are we going to use for synchronous classes? Google Meet, which is free. It has no time limit till September 30, 2020 for a call with 100 participants. Zoom, its basic plan has a free call of 40 minutes for 100 participants and unlimited for one-on-one -on -one calls. So if you are teaching research, and you would like to discuss the research of, or even if you are a research advisor and you would like to discuss um, with each other one-on-one, -on -one, then you can use Zoom because it's unlimited. You can actually talk for 20 more hours if you can and if you like. But if you ask me, 40 minutes is already okay for online synchronous learning. You don't really, I do not recommend for teachers to conduct a lengthy lecture online. A one hour straight lecture online will bore your students to death. And you will not even be sure that after 15 minutes, they're still listening to you. They might be doing something else. And you're not even aware of that. Okay. So 40 minutes is okay. Cisco WebEx, free 50 minutes for 100 participants. And Microsoft Teams, what you have to pay because I don't think it's ever for free. And the highly recommended one, especially for those with limited connectivity is Facebook Messenger. Why? Because it's easy to use. Those with poor signal can use it. You download Messenger Lite, especially if your smartphone has one gigabyte of RAM only, use Messenger Lite. Messenger has a group call feature called Facebook Messenger Rooms. It functions like a Zoom call. Try it when you can. It is recommended for plenary discussions. It promotes high interaction among students. 
Links for videos and online surveys can be sent using it. You can upload PowerPoint, Word, and Excel, Excel documents too. Ideal for small group classes. But the challenge, the challenges would be class management. If you're handling more than 20 students, then it becomes a little bit more challenging to handle a synchronous class. Ah, synchronous class, not asynchronous. A synchronous class using Facebook Messenger. And if you're chatting for more than an hour, your thumb gets numb. Believe me, it happened to me because I was able to do that for like more than an hour and a half. Five, have a lesson plan to manage your class. Of course, all teachers have lesson plans. All teachers in higher education have a syllabus. But the challenge now is that we have to review and revise our syllabus or lesson plan because we need to make it an online syllabus or online lesson plan. What's the first thing that you're supposed to do in a traditional class? You check the attendance, right? So how do you check the attendance in an online class? Use Google Form. But I told you a while ago, Google Forms become a little bit complicated, especially if it's your first time to use it. But however, the advantage is that if you check the attendance using Google Forms, it actually tells you exactly what time they check in. So if they are late in your class, you will know. You will know for sure. This is the an example of the attendance that I used in our webinar for the College of Education here in Iloilo Science and Technology University, and I just changed the names through Paint. Yan. So, uh, kasama ko si Peter Pan. Now, my recommendation instead of Google Forms, use Survey Heart. Now, if you have an Android point, if you have an Android phone, chances are it's already there. You just did not open it. Try to explore your Android phone. I think it's there. Just check it out because I discovered that in my phone already. I did not download that. It's recommended for use by those who find Google Forms complicated. It has templates already for various uses. That's why I'm recommending it. Remember our goal for today? simplify things. I'm recommending things to you because they're simple, because they're easy to use, and you will not have a hard time using it, and you will not be intimidated using it. So unlike Google Forms, the data you get from SurveyHeart saves directly in the app and not in a Microsoft Excel. Because if you use Google Forms for surveys, what happens is the data that you get from Google Forms, it saves on an Excel uh application and for somebody who's just learning and trying to teach online for the first time that is complicated so survey hard makes things easier for you because it saves everything on the application itself and you will see who's late you will know who's absent etc so these are um an, the example templates that you will see in Google Heart. You can use it for self-evaluation for your students or attendance, or you can also create blank forms if you like. If you are teaching HE, because most of my colleague friends are from the uh, home economic department, uh, TTE department, uh, you can use it for your classes. So let's say, for example, you are simulating um, on how to predict the taste of the food, the plating of the food, etc. You can just change the title here and you can indicate inside. Uh, there are 12 questions, which means you can just write there whatever questions you would like your students and they can just answer it for you and their answers will automatically just save on your phone even if you don't, you don't see each other, if you, even if you're far away from each other. So it's easy. The question is, can you also use this for quizzes, for formative quizzes? Yes, you can. 
So you can also use it for general feedback, general meeting feedback if you have a meeting and instructor feedback for supervisors or head of the department or dean for that matter. Okay. So how do you manage your online classroom, especially if you're using Facebook Messenger, like what I have given you as an example a while ago. I mentioned that a while ago, where your thumbs get numb. So it is very important that you give your students rules to follow. You're supposed to have house rules. And you give the house rules ahead. You don't give them on the day of the class. Because you have to make use of your time well. So give it ahead so that during their free time, they can read it. Give it asynchronously. So this is an example of the house rules that I have in my Facebook Messenger group chat with my students where I hold online class most of the time. Signify your attendance. This is addressing them, okay? Signify your attendance to this class by clicking the Google Forms link posted. That's for their attendance. Type your answers only after a question is asked that's during the class already. Should you want to raise a question, ask permission first. Alvin Cruz, ma, may I be permitted to ask a question? Then wait for the teacher's response. Why is it necessary to tell them this? Because you have to manage your class. If you allow them to post anything at any time, all of you will get confused and nothing will get done and nothing will be learned for that hour. And time is wasted. Okay, so don't forget to give them this a day before. The teacher will wait for everyone's answer to each question, so don't type follow-up sentences so as not to confuse the teacher. If you need to add an idea to your answer, erase the first one and post a new one. All answers are read by the teacher. The online class is different from the usual face-to-face -face class in the classroom, so please avoid unnecessary jokes and snipe cam comments. Because believe it or not, if you don't tell them this, your, when, when a classmate answers something that they find funny, the rest that will follow are jokes and never ending jokes. And your class will just be, will just go our way. When you type your answer or reply to the teacher, do it this way, Alvin Cruz, all caps. Word synonym is an example of an analogy. Note, why do I ask my students to really type their name every time they give their answer, all cap? This is, the reason for that is very personal. Why? Because I can't see small letters. Exactly why I'm using eyeglasses. I can't see very small letters, and that is my problem. So I would usually ask them to type with capital letters. And some of them would say, Mom, do I really have to type my name every time I answer a question, all caps? Because, you know, I can just answer. And I said, no, you really have to type your name. Why? Because some of them are using nicknames in the group chat. And I don't know who Loverboy1234 is, but I know who Alvin Cruz is, right? And sometimes they forget to change their nickname into their real name. So it is a requirement for them to type their full name before the answer. Number eight, this means that you always have to type your name, all caps with a colon after it before typing your answer. So it is easier for the teacher to track those who are active in class discussion. If there are students in face-to-face -face classes who do not recite, there are students in an online classroom that also do not recite. There, so you can actually track who is that reciting based on the names appearing on your screen. Only the teacher can give a thumbs up or a thumbs down emoji on post for scoring purposes. Thumbs up would mean three to five points, thumbs down meaning you don't get any points for that answer. And my students understand that very well. They don't do that. They don't use that. But the rest of them can use the emoji, the heart emoji, the laughing emoji, the crying emoji. You can. They, they can freely use that. And you will know if they find an answer that's really very funny because a lot of laughing emojis will be posted, will be attached on that um, answer. Use your real full name. 
when attending online classes. You have to remind them about that. Be on time because the, start, the class starts on time. When you are having online classes, start on time, please, because you don't have a reason to be late in an online class. Why? Because even if you're mobile, you can start an online class. The only reason for you to be late in an online class is if you don't have signal. And that would be impossible in any country, I think, for that matter, especially if you know that you're having a class on that day. So I'm going to show you this sample lesson plan. This is a semi-detailed online lesson plan in English 6. This um, is adapted from the work of Jane H. Basto. Uh, Jane Basto posted this lesson plan which was created to be traditionally delivered in a face-to-face -face classroom. He, she posted this on Pinterest. See, Pinterest has lesson plans. And you think Pinterest only has um, food pictures, uh, fashion pictures, photography pictures. No, there are lesson plans on Pinterest. I, I actually got this from Pinterest. So this is a lesson plan by Jane Basto which should which which um which was designed to be delivered in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom but i tried to recreate it so that somebody can deliver this online okay so of course you have objectives you have your cognitive psychomotor and your affective objective here note in this uh affective objective i included social learning appreciated the importance of context clues through social learning. Why? Because I'm going to use Facebook for as, as a technology tool for delivering this class. And Facebook is a social media app. So you have there your topic, vocabulary enhancement lesson, context clues, your materials. Let's focus on this. You have your laptop, internet connection, video clip via YouTube Go, which means you have to be very specific. So that if somebody would like to use your lesson plan, they know exactly that you're going to use not just the usual YouTube, but YouTube Go. YouTube Go, Facebook Groups, Facebook Rooms, Microsoft PowerPoint, and Microsoft Word. And you have your references there. So for the procedure, review via Facebook Messenger chat group for five minutes only. This is for one hour. So I divided every part to fill in the one hour. Ask the class about the previous lesson. Ask the students about their synthesis of the previous lesson. Motivation via Facebook rooms. And you use PowerPoint slides for five minutes. Because as I said a while ago, Facebook rooms function like a Zoom call. So you can show your PowerPoint there and everyone can see each other and everyone can say something ask questions about the lecture using a PowerPoint. It, this is not a lecture, actually. This is just a motivation. They will be guessing the word, okay? Play the guesswork game. And for the activities, buy a Facebook video chat for breakout sessions for 10 minutes. Prior to your class for that day, you already give your students an instruction. You already group your students into five into yeah four groups of five students and ask them ahead of time to create their own small group because you're going to use that for your breakout sessions for 10 minutes make sure that in those small groups they have also added you why because you need to check their video chat you have to listen to what they're talking about otherwise how will you know if they're really discussing about the lesson or they're just you know um talking about whatever under the sun abstraction via youtube go post the link in facebook messenger group watch for 10 minutes proceed to the next lesson which is vocabulary enhancement ask the learners about their ideas in vocabulary uh, introduce the meaning of vocabulary enhancement introduce the vocabulary in before they watch um, the video clip in YouTube Go, you have to chat to them a little bit first, okay? Anyway, it's just in Facebook Messenger, so you're already there. And you do this for 10 minutes. 
for application via Facebook Rooms or Facebook Messenger, depending on what you prefer. Because when you say Facebook Rooms, that would mean it's a call. You see each other. On Facebook Messenger, it's just chatting synchronously without you know, seeing the faces of your students. Using PPT slides for 10 minutes, you upload your PowerPoint so that they can view it. The teacher let the students read the question on the screen and let them answer each number. Assessment via Facebook groups for 15 minutes. Know that you can actually create a quiz using Facebook groups. That's why I told you a while ago to check out um, how it's done through the channel of Dr. Lumawag because it's discussed there. The students will find the words using vocabulary and context in the given statement. Assignment via Facebook groups and Microsoft Word for five minutes. Give an example for each type of context group stated in the document uploaded. So that is an example online lesson plan. You really were able to strategize on what pedagogy you're going to use to, with what content and with what technology. This is the output using TPAC. Online assessment application. What are the recommended free apps for assessment? As I mentioned a while ago, and I don't need to repeat my reasons why, number one is Edmodo, forever and ever, Edmodo. And then Google Classroom. But in order for you to create a quiz for Google Classroom, you should know how to also operate Google Forms and Facebook group. That's the third. So uh, we all know the types of online assessment. Of course, if you're a teacher, you know this. You have diagnostic, formative, authentic, summative. Um, I, had, I have a mentor who said, just give one assessment per, per semester. Do not burden your students. And I think that's a very sound advice. But everyone is different. So that's why I'm just offering this to you. I'm just presenting this to you, just in case if you really like to give your students assessment. So can you do diagnostic assessment online? Yes. Why? Uh, well, this is online teaching, learning how to teach online. So that's why, yes, you can um, create, uh, do diagnostic assessment online, formative assessment online, authentic assessment online. But I would like to really recommend that you do summative assessment offline if and only if your school allows it or your community allows it or your LGUs allows it, local government units. Because if they don't, then of course you have to do it online. You don't have a choice. So for diagnostic assessment uh, online, you can use Google Forms, Google Classroom, Edmodo, Facebook Group. For formative assessment, you can use Google Forms also, the same thing, Google Classroom, Edmodo, and Facebook Groups. For summative assessment, as I mentioned, it is recommended, but still you can do it online if you prefer, face-to-face -face or send your exam through a courier, pen and paper test. So you would ask me, who will pay for the courier? Well, if you have so much money and you're so compassionate anyway, it's just once per term, do it for your students. For the love of teaching and for the love of your students, pay for it if it doesn't cost so much, okay? That's what, that is your contribution in your academic community and in the lives of your students, okay? But if your school can shoulder that, then hallelujah, very good. Authentic assessment, you can use YouTube. Facebook Live is recommended specifically for authentic assessment. Vimeo, Google Classroom, Edmodo, and Facebook groups. So remember, you have to follow the learning continuity plan for your school, of your school. There are schools that will not allow face-to-face -face meetings in the first semester of academic year 2020-2021. And if your school does the same, then you have to look for ways to give a summative assessment online. If your internet connection is good, I really recommend that you use Edmodo. Okay. So uh, just a reminder, online safety, secure passwords and login details. A lot of us forget our passwords. Write them down in a secure 
notebook or diary or wherever. Don't put it in your phone because if you lose your phone, then you lose everything. Um, lag out from public computers every time. But during the time of the pandemic, it is not recommended that you use public computers. Because, and, it, well, and if you do, then make sure you have this one so you can clean the keyboards first before using them. Uh, regular check your privacy settings. Your privacy is of utmost importance. And do not accept invites from people you don't know. As I mentioned a while ago, in Ilo Science and Technology University, we are going to use officially Facebook as our LMS for the first semester. So you know what I did? I created a separate Facebook account just for my classes. And that Facebook account has a description there that it is solely going to be used for instructional delivery. And those who will be accepted in that account are only my students for that particular semester, no one else. Why? For safety purposes, online safety. So um, the good thing that the pandemic has brought in the academic community is increased collaboration. You have to admit, schools, teachers have increased collaboration, making sure that teaching and learning be continued in this year of you know, unprecedented crisis in this time of the pandemic. So that is one thing, that is one good thing that came out of this particular crisis that we have right now. It's a global crisis, but that doesn't mean that we should not rise above the crisis that we are experiencing right now. Maintain a healthy dose of curiosity for technology. I would like to tell everyone I am not an IT graduate nor an IT expert. No, I'm not. I have just been super curious about technology and applications ever since. But the funny thing about me is I would usually stick with the applications that are easier to use for everyone and for myself. So maintain that curiosity and master the particular application that you've chosen so that you may be able to use it for a long, long time. Just like me using Edmodo since 2012 until now. And of course, in online classes, simplicity is key. We have to simplify everything for our students. Let us not burden them. Let us not burden ourselves because I know you have a lot of preparations to do. You are teaching not just one subject, but um, some are having four preparations. So, you know, make everything simple from your outcomes, from the exams, from the assessment, from content, and as well as technology, and as well as ped pedagogy. Think about it strategize well, and plan very well before the start of classes arrive. So that's it. This is, these are my online sources. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now. Maybe you have questions and I will do my best to answer them. Okay, thank you, Professor Naponi, for your presentation. You're welcome. Our session for this afternoon is only allocated for two hours. We will cater as many questions as possible depending on the availability of our time. We will select questions raised by our participants in Facebook, YouTube, and Zoom. To our participants who will be tapped to ask questions via Zoom, I would like you to introduce yourself first, the institution where you are affiliated with, and your question. Okay, so we have one participant here. We have Mom Stephanie A. Baliaho. Okay, Mom Stephanie, you are recognized. And I would like you again to introduce yourself first, the institution where you are affiliated with, and your question. Okay. 
Okay, while waiting for Ma'am Baliao to appear on and uh, provide her question, again, I would like to encourage our participants here to be courteous, most importantly, in dealing with or in throwing questions. Okay, and I would like also to greet our participants, especially from different parts of the country. We have those who would like to have uh, themselves to be personally recognized. But then again, we will see later on if we still have time. Okay, Mambaliao is now recognized. Mambaliao. Hello. Hello, oh, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Stephanie Angeles Baliaho of Sambuanga City Division. Specifically, I am teaching at Cebulo Elementary School. Now, DepEd is encouraging schools to adopt flexible learning to address pupils' needs during the pandemic. But geographically speaking, our school is located at a far distance from the city with poor internet connectivity, and most pupils cannot afford to be online. The suggestions or recommendations of the presenter is, I think it, it would be possible for high uh, pupils from the high grades, but what best recommendation can you give to teachers who are teaching in grade one? That oh, would be okay. all. <laughs> um, thank you, Mom Stephanie, for, for interacting with us. Um, I am a higher education institution faculty, uh, but I also have taught in secondary. I taught grade 12. And I don't really have experience teaching in, in elementary grades or grade one. So I, it would be safe for me not to give advice on that because I, I, really, I have not taught in the elementary grades. But um, that is also one of the problems of our university uh, as of the moment because we have students who do not have signal based on what I have shown a while ago, 27% of our students do not have connectivity at all. So what our university administration has uh, decided is to create modules for them. And these modules will be sent to them via courier. So if we translate that to the elementary grades, I am not so sure if that would be effective because it's basically teaching in the elementary grades is different. So I would like to refrain from giving advice on that. Test, mic test. Can you hear me? Um, can you can you please clarify further what you mean by practical work approach? Okay, we have another question from Mr. Joe Pelibuon. The question, Ma'am Napon, is what LMS can you suggest to cater equation solving scenario? I don't know if you can provide answer to this question, Ma'am. LMS. Okay, uh, actually, the, the very challenge for mathematics teachers would be to look for the applications that they could use and post in the LMS. You can basically use any LMS. You can use Google Classroom, you can use Edmodo, you can use uh, Facebook groups, but the question there is, mm -hmm. do you have an application that is specifically for that topic in mathematics? Because I believe you cannot just simply, if, if, you, if you post problem solving 
problems, just problems on any of those elements, it's easy, right? But if there are already numbers and there are or there are already certain characters, then it is advisable for you to really look for an application for that specific content or topic. Okay, we have another live question here in Zoom. We have Mr. Olf Skarpenberg. Sir Olf, your question is recognized. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. So I'm, uh, let me shortly introduce myself. I'm the head teacher and co-owner of a German language academy here in Manila. So for, uh, for gadgets, we are using some various apps, but I never used that model before. So is it also adaptive for German language to use? Um, again, please. Um, is that model also adaptive uh, to use for German language? As I'm the head teacher of a German uh, language, I never used this before. Oh, okay, sir. Uh, Edmodo actually is in English. I'm not uh, so sure if there is um, a German language version for Edmodo, but you can try to check it out online. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Okay, again, that's Sir Olf Skarpenberg. Thank you, sir. He's all the way from Germany. And we have Ma'am Ermi Lux El Matildo. We have Ma'am Ermi Lux Matildo in the line. Okay, so her question is, students nowadays are more, more prone to social media, are more prone to social media use like Facebook, how can we motivate them to actively participate in our class using also social media platforms? Um, hello, ma'am. Thank you so much for interacting. That would depend. Remember, remember a while ago I mentioned that as teachers, we need to strategize our uh, instructional delivery. So based on TPAC, you have to look into your content and at the same time, choose a strategy, and at the same time, choose a technology that you could partner with the, the, the two. Now, your creativity will come from the type of pedagogy or strategy that you're going to use on delivering the content partnered with the type of technology also. If you mix them all together perfectly, then I'm sure that your students will never find your online class boring. Okay, thank you, Professor Naponi. We have here a Facebook question. Her question is, I am worried about cheating or dishonesty or kopyahan. My conscientious students kind of hinted to me that cheating will be so easy in this new setup. They can really find ways to create a secret group and they can collaborate in, uh, to cheat. May I know what is your take on this and how can we avoid this? Thank you from Rizal, Angono National High School, UP Diliman. Hello, um, thank you for interacting. Um, I have colleagues from the ICT department and this is the same question that we have also been asking them. Can you please help us to make sure that students don't cheat online? And you know what their answer is? You can never totally eradicate cheating online because you know why? Students even cheat even if you are there in front of them. So it's, it's, it's a given. Now, how, how do we minimize this? We minimize this by choosing an application that helps you limit the cheating. And that was why I recommended Edmodo because Edmodo is time. You can time your quizzes so that your students will never have time anymore to go to another secret group chat and ask their classmates for um, answers. But even if I could not really totally guarantee that we'll, they will not do that because you yourself has actually stated that our students right now are very talented when it comes to technology and they know a lot 
they, they know how to create secret groups to get answers, etc. So um, most of our mentors and most of the resource speakers in other seminars that I have attended recommended that you give um, authentic assessment. Because in authentic assessment, basically, you don't get to cheat. Your students tell you about how they feel, what they think about a certain topic, a certain lesson. So, you know, you, you know more about them. And I think that's more meaningful. Okay, thank you, Professor Napone. And again, that's a, a question from Rizal in Angono National High School. Do we still have questions coming from Facebook? Okay, let's take a look at another question here in Zoom. I guess this will serve as our last question. We have still from Sir Jophil Libuon. Tertiary level, the in the tertiary level, the curriculum is, sorry, OBE. How can we integrate OBE curriculum on this online kind of setup we have? Um, well, you basically create a syllabi, right? Your syllabus is OBE. And you know if the syllabus is OBE because of the learning outcomes. So if your learning outcomes are there, all you have to do is support that with the technology that you're going to use to make sure that you and your students are able to achieve that outcome. So in that case, you have integrated OBE and online together. Okay, so Professor Naponi, we have here last question from um, Mam Elenita R. Fortes. Okay, she's from PUP. Her question is, I am going to teach advanced dictation and transcription shorthand. This is a skill subject. What is the most appropriate LMS can you suggest? Thank you, ma'am. Um, as I mentioned a while ago, you can use any LMS for that matter. The challenge for this a highly skilled content or topic is for you to look for an application that helps you really show shorthand. Uh, because there are, in, in that particular class, there are certain ways on how to write things, right? So you have to really look for an application for that. For one, um, Huawei, and I know, I'm not so sure if other Android devices has this, you can write using a pen. But the challenge there is, how are you going to upload that on the LMS? So what I did was to record it using the screen. If you're using a tablet, you can re record whatever you're writing on the tablet using screen record. So if you're giving your class an activity on shorthand writing, you can make them, you can use that application, you can make them screen record what they're writing and then upload it on YouTube and give you the link. The problem is that that tab is not cheap and the pen itself is also not cheap. So it costs money. That's the downside of that. Thank you, Professor Naponi. Again, that question came from one of the active members of our organization from PUP. So I would like to greet our, our members there in PUP. Okay, and that ends our question and answer portion. We will try to reply to some of your queries raised after the end of the session. Obviously, the problem we have has something to do with the availability of our time. Before we proceed with, with our closing remarks, let me read to you some announcements. As again, we have a lot of questions in dealing with the certificate of participation. I was able to inform it to you a while ago, but then again, I would like to announce it again. To earn a certificate of participation, you must sign up the evaluation or attendance form that are posted in Zoom, Facebook page, and YouTube channel. The certificate of participation will be sent to your respective email right after the webinar. Take note. Only paid participants will receive this certificate. However, if you are around and want to receive a certificate, kindly fill up the evaluation or attendance form and send an email or send an email to PISI21. 
paid participants who didn't receive their certificate of participation within a day, please email to centuryeducators1920 at gmail.com or centuryeducator21gmail.com. This time, I would like to request again the president of PISI 21, Professor Emmy Jan Indonila Palmani. She will give us some words before we formally close our webinar. To my co 21st century educators, a pleasant afternoon again. I am very sorry for the technical problem we had during the start of our webinar. But then as teachers, we must be flexible and must have grace under pressure as much as possible. We are all facing one of the greatest challenges in our lives, and that is the battle to survive and defeat this enemy, which we just our naked eyes cannot be seen, COVID-19. But then there's a saying, I firmly believe that everything is made with a purpose and that every problem has a solution. When it comes to education, which is one of the major needs of the human being, PIS 21, PORREP, and CESREP believe that one of the solutions for the challenge is to strengthen our pedagogy and teaching. For us educators to be flexible in adapting some minor or even major changes in our teaching strategies. And that's why we gathered all of you this afternoon in this webinar to discuss some ways we can do to defeat this pandemic without compromising the quality of education the students truly deserve. For us 21st century educators, technology plays a vital role in our profession most especially in our present situation, where everybody is encouraged to be adept in using at least the basics of the virtual world. This is why most of the professionals nowadays are into online meetings, such as what we are doing right now, to help our government also to contain COVID-19. As for our webinar, we have learned from Professor Naponi how to teach online so that we can still deliver our lessons effectively to our students the new normal way. I know that accepting and adapting to change could be sometimes challenging, but then if you're a true educator with a burning passion in teaching, you will give all your best for your beloved profession. And I know each of us present in this webinar possesses this quality. Perhaps you will agree with me that education is a never ending process, that every experience teaches us a new learning in life. I hope that though we had some technical problems in the beginning of this webinar, you still have gained a new experience from which we could use in our quest for higher learning. Before I end my message, let me thank the persons behind the realization of this noble task. Dr. Gina Haresco, the National President of CESREP, Dr. Raymond Moreno, the National President of PORREP, Professor Ricky Kibinko, Professor Jerry Hovacon, Mr. Isidro Ville Jr., Professor Jan Michael Sonsa, Professor Jose Abrian Casella, Professor Charles Isulan, and the group, you know who you are, to our resource speaker, Professor Gisa Naponi, and of course, to all of you, our dear participants, you are all indeed epitomes of 21st century educators. Thank you for your support, our dear 21st century educators, and I hope to see you again on the 31st for our international webinar, which will be announced later by Sir Casella. Again, I am Mrs. Emichan and Donila Palmani, your PIS 21 national president. To God be the glory. To formally close our webinar, may I request Dr. Raymond B. Moreno the national president of professional organization of researchers and educators of the Philippines incorporated or for, for his closing message. Yes, I know.
Okay, we'll go back to the video or to the closing remark of Dr. Moreno later on. Again, I would like to grab this opportunity to thank my fellow members and officers of PICE I-21. We have Professor Ricky Ekibinko, Professor Jerry Hubacon, Mr. John Michael Sonsa, Mr. Cyril De La Puente, Mr. Isidro Villa, Mr. Adam Donald Junio, Mr. Raymond Casho, Mr. Charles Isulan, Mr. Chito Tominez, Mr. Jose Jean Monticado, and Professor Emmy Jan Palman. We would like also to thank the ever dynamic Dr. Gina Haresto. She's the national president of the Center for Scholarly Researches of Educators of the Philippines Incorporated, or CISRE, and Dr. Raymond B. Moreno, national president of Professional Organization of Researchers and Educators of the Philippines Incorporated, or FOREP. To our colleagues here in Iloilo Science and Technology University and all the active members of our three professional organizations, thank you for your continual support. Kodus also to Professor Giza Naponi for making this webinar a successful one. Again, see you on another webinar, this time an international virtual conference on 21st century educators this July 31, 2020. Our conference will be conducted by Mr. Paul Ryan Mark N. Salsat, is a book author and curriculum and educational consultant of various schools here in the Philippines. You may check at our official Facebook page for you to get access to details. The first 31 participants will have free registration for the webinar. You may open the link on our official social media page and YouTube channel for more details. We have several expected participants who came all the way from India, Romania, and Indonesia. So again, to formally close our webinar, may I request Professor or Dr. Raymond B. Moreno, the National President of Professional Organization of Researchers and Educators of the Philippines Incorporated, or FOREP. Okay, na. Okay, we are struggling with technical difficulty with the video or the closing message of Dr. Moreno. Okay, again, I would like to thank everyone who joined in our webinar. So I would like to reiterate again the international virtual conference we have, and that is already on July 31, 2020. We have the official link. Again, you can see it or follow us in our official YouTube channel. We have the POMI, and we also have our official Facebook page, the PISE I-21. Okay, we have those also who are asking questions about how to get the soft copy of the presentation of Professor Naponi. She will give the soft copy especially to 100 participants we have. We will send it into your email. Okay, thank you again. And we have the official link of the official YouTube channel we have. We have those who are asking soft copy again. We will send it to your email address.
What about the link of the evaluation? We would also send it into our official Facebook channel. Thank you so much. And see you on our virtual conference this July 31. And this time it's an international virtual conference. Thank you for your continual support. Stay safe, everyone. God bless and congratulations. Thank you.